This is the third in a series of videos that are designed to help independent learners engage in self-directed study of important and influential philosophical authors, texts, and movements. This one focuses on a very important school of ancient philosophy that still has adherence today, and that is Stoicism. So I'm going to be talking a lot about different Stoic authors that you might read and how you can approach them and what you want to be attentive to and what you don't need to actually worry about, since I know there's people who get quite uh, concerned about, about some things, and that can sometimes be an impediment holding them back from studying it. We're going to talk about uh, approaches that you can take and uh, a whole bunch of other things as well. Now, the Stoics are so important. You, it's a little bit fortuitous here, but you can notice on the bookshelf behind me a whole bunch of uh, literature, <laughs> secondary literature mostly, of Stoicism. I'll be pulling some of these off the shelf as we, we talk about uh, what, what you need to be paying attention to in this video, particularly when we're looking at translations and texts. The Stoics are quite important. We're going to talk about that in just a minute, why you should study them. Um, they're also rather challenging, so you want to have a few things in mind as you're approaching them. And with any independent study, I think there's a few things that, that go across the board for any philosopher that you're going to read. So we'll talk about those aspects as well. A preliminary question that really does deserve an answer is why should we study the Stoics in the first place? And in order to answer that question, we really need to ask another question. Who are the Stoics? And when it comes down to it, most of what you would be studying would in fact be people who are part of what we call the late Stoa, or the, sometimes they call it the Roman Stoa. Three thinkers in particular, Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius. Those are the people that you'd encounter at the start. There were many other Stoics be, before them, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But why should you study these three thinkers in particular? Well, they are representatives of a very important school of ancient Greek, and then it spreads, to, of course, to the Roman uh, domain as well, philosophy. Um, Stoicism in its time was really one of the big contenders. We often treat philosophy as if it's, well, it's Plato, and there's the pre-Socratics before them, and then there's Aristotle, and then there's all this Hellenistic stuff, and we, we kind of push it to the side, and they were mostly concerned with, like, you know, ethics and philosophy of life, but they were kind of a decline. And that's actually a wrong-headed view on philosophy, but unfortunately, one, that many of the histories of philosophy of the 19th and 20th centuries push as a narrative, a narrative that turns out to be false when you start going to the text. So the Stoics were massively influential in their own time. You find the Aristotelians and Platonists and Eclectics and, and Skeptics and Epicureans and other people all engaging with the Stoics. That's something that tells you that their philosophy really mattered. They have a lot to offer, as we're going to talk about, uh, just on their own. And they continued to play an important role in influencing not only philosophy, but, but culture more broadly, long after the school ceased to exist as an independent school. So, you know, a, a number of different practices and insights from Stoicism, sometimes actual texts like Epictetus's and Caridian, got absorbed into Christian thought throughout the Middle Ages. And once the Stoics were sort of rediscovered as such in the Renaissance and then onward into the modern period, they were really engaged. You're going to find thinkers like Descartes drawing upon Stoic thought and, and having Princess Elizabeth, uh, you know, actually read Seneca with him and discuss Seneca. You're going to find David Hume discussing the Stoics as a possible, you know, philosophical way of life in his own time, a philosophical approach. We could go on and on and on. 
it's really only in the 19th and 20th centuries that you get this this take that the Stoics, along with the Epicureans and skeptics, and also the Neoplatonics, really don't matter that much. In their own time, they were among the you know most popular schools, um, and, and it's quite interesting too if you think about it. Once you start reading them, they're very rigorous about things. So why would the why would they be popular? Why would they capture the imagination? and the allegiances of so many people. Well, because there's a lot there in Stoic philosophy to study. So another key point that I want to bring up, and you're going to see this particularly when you read Seneca, when you read Epictetus, perhaps a little bit less with Marcus Aurelius, um, and, and you're also going to see this when you read somebody like Cicero, that Stoicism itself is quite a complex uh, developmental philosophy full of all sorts of very interesting ideas and, and, you know, propositions about what you might do. There's some great arguments there. There's lots of interesting distinctions. There's, there's a, a ton of things to sink your teeth into. And it's grounded on, you might say, dealing with life, trying to make sense out of all the things that other philosophers are concerned with. So it's well worth reading for that. Um, by studying the Stoics, you're going to be introduced to some additional new perspectives and ideas and distinctions and problems within philosophy, um, things that you want to try to wrap your head around, not only because they, they were influential and taken up by other authors later on, but also because these are worth studying in their own Right. And with the Stoics, I think there's an additional impetus, and this may be the, the first one for many people. Modern Stoicism um, has become a, a, a sort of a going concern. There are hundreds of thousands of people now who use Stoic philosophy in one way or another, and, and with varying degrees of accuracy and depth, but they use it to make sense out of their life, their decisions, their personal development, their workplaces, their relationships. And so, you know, if Stoicism always was a philosophy as a way of life kind of approach. It really is so in the present. And I think that's another reason why it's worth knowing something about Stoicism. And it's really important to know something about authentic Stoicism, not just to read a few popular uh, texts or blog entries, which might be completely wrong about what, <clears throat> what Stoicism is actually preaching. So those are reasons why I think it's worthwhile to dig into Stoicism. One of the questions that I always get asked by people engaging in self-directed study is what editions and what translations of the core texts do I need to have? And often lying behind that is a concern about getting it right that I'd like to say a little bit about. There's a number of different translations from most important authors who wrote in something other than English. And you're not going to lead yourself astray unless you make the mistake of thinking that the translation is exactly the same thing as the original text. Um, you're not going to damage your, your mind or you know start off on the wrong foot if you have a translation that's not completely contemporary or, or one that you even struggle with because of the way that the, the translator decided to render certain terms. You should expect you're going to read and reread and reread anyway, and I'm going to come back to that point later. It's often good if you can't read the original language to consult several different translations. When it comes to the Stoics, there are a number of different translations for every one of the main authors out there. Uh, going back, you know, quite a ways, some of them several centuries in English. And those can be a bit difficult, but even the very contemporary modern translations are often challenging as well. So you don't have to put any pressure on yourself that you have to get the right translation or the right text, because there isn't any. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, you know, what sort of 
texts and translations you might want to have. And, and you notice I'm holding these books in my hand. This is Epictetus in the Loeb edition, which is the Old Father translation, a rather old translation. Um, it's two volumes, you know, his four books. And what's really cool about this, other than the fact that you can see I take a lot of notes, is the fact that what you have here is Greek on one side and English on the other. Um, not very helpful, I think, for readers who can't read Greek, right? And, and Epictetus, by the way, wrote in Koine, not in Attic Greek, um, because he's, you know, a person of his, of his time. You can just as well get something like this. This is the Everyman uh, edition of Epictetus's Discourses, uh, Handbook or Enchiridion and Fragments, which, by the way, the Loeb contains as well. And it's, you know, it's it's a good enough translation. It's it's not necessarily great at every point, but that that's in part because it's difficult to translate somebody like Epictetus. And this you can get fairly cheaply. Um, there's a number of different translations of Epictetus out there. I, I can't say that, you know, any of them are, are really terrible, but I can't say that any of them are perfect. Uh, and that's because I'm a translator myself. The key is to find something that's going to work for you. And Epictetus, if you're going to study Stoicism, is definitely somebody who you're going to spend time with. Um, Seneca, another great example. Here's two uh, uh, common uh, translations of his letters. Um, this one is... Uh, the the uh, Gumer translation, which is not bad, um, a little bit dated. Uh, the the really nice thing about this is how cheap it is. We actually use this in our Stoic Fellowship meeting, so that we're literally all on the same page. If you want to invest a little bit of money, you might get a more contemporary translation, including this one by Graver and Long, two very important. Um, uh, scholars and translators when it comes to Stoicism. And this is uh, University of Chicago Press. Uh, these are very recent, quite good. There's other uh, Seneca books in the same series that you might check out. I've left a couple of them on the, the shelf, but here's one that includes various works <coughs> of his that have to do with hardship and happiness. They're, they're organized according to, to theme. So, you know, those are, those are nice to have. Um, I'll mention as well a few other works that you're probably going to want to find, um, all of which are fairly inexpensive. There's, you know, Cicero. Cicero is available in the Loeb. There's a lot of translations of Cicero. I do think that these Cambridge texts in the history of political thought or in the history of philosophy are quite nice. I've got, you know, the on duties and the on moral ends here, quite good. But there's a number of other translations of Cicero available. Arius Didymus' Epitome of Stoic Ethics, Greek on facing page. Um, this, is, this is a work that you'll want somewhere down the line. And then there's this Heracles the Stoic, uh, elements of ethics, fragments, and excerpts. Mostly a book full of notes. Um, the the actual translation is fairly short, and again, you know, Greek on on facing page. So don't allow yourself to get too bogged down in worrying about having the right translation. It can be nice, actually, as I said, to have multiple translations. Uh, so you can compare and contrast them. You know, I, I read the Latin, but I, I you know, spend a lot of time reading these two translations of Seneca. And if I see something that seems kind of off or, you know, there's a big divergence, well, then I'm back in the Latin checking it out. But that's not necessary for you to do all of the time. Um, try to find something that, that really works well for you. Something that you can, you know, when you're reading it, you can get something out of it. You can walk away from that and say, I understand this. And, and realize, as I, as I mentioned before, you're going to have to read and reread this stuff multiple times, in part because there are a lot of Stoic terms that are a bit difficult to translate effectively. So I'm going to say a few things about, about those. And some of these would go for other um, Greek and Latin terms that, that, you know, other authors or movements might use. One thing that's really key is the notion of eudaimonia or, you know, happiness, sometimes translated as flourishing. There's no really great translation for that Greek term and, and that's okay. Um, 
Likewise, there's a number of other terms that the Stoics themselves came up with, like indifference and preferred and rejected indifference. If you read Cicero, you're going to find him discussing how these ought to be translated, because Cicero himself was somebody who was rendering Stoic philosophy from its Greek original into a Latin form. So there's, there's a lot of things where understanding what's what's going on it's going to be a cumulative process on your part the translations are not designed to get in the way so don't allow them to become a stumbling block for yourself another book and author focused question that i get asked very early on when people want to begin studying stoicism is who do I have to start with and which work and in what order should I be reading these books? And th there's a related question too, which is maybe I'm not really up to starting with the original authors from ancient philosophy, Epictetus, Seneca, and Marcus Aurelius. Maybe I should read, you know, a summary written by a 20th or 21st century philosopher, more, a more popular work. And by the way, when it comes to that, I think, no, no, don't deprive yourself of the opportunity of grappling with real philosophy head on uh, in its native habitat rather than being given the guided tour by somebody who might be leaving some stuff out or might give you some wrong impressions about things. I mean, if you want to begin by, by reading summaries, that, that's okay. I'm not going to say that it, you know, it's going to ruin you or anything like that. But I do see a lot of people arriving at the original text afterwards and saying, wow, I didn't know that this was here. Or man, I, I got a mistaken understanding of what was going on in, in these thinkers because I read so-and-so before that. It's better to go straight to the, the uh, originals, I think. So where should you start? Well, we have three authors, Seneca, we have a lot of writings by Seneca, um, we have Epictetus, we, we have you know some stuff by him, the discourses which are kind of long, uh, the Enchiridion, and then some, some fragments here and there. Not written by Epictetus, by the way, but written by his student Arian. And then we have Marcus Aurelius's pretty short meditations. Those are the, the three authors that you should be starting with. And now where should you start in terms of books? A lot of people like to start with Aurelius's meditations in part because it's, it's pretty accessible and it's short and it's, you know, kind of scattered in its emphasis. Um, you know, he, there, it's divided into books. Uh, which would be, you know, correlative to what we call chapters these days. And it kind of moves from point to point to point. Um, so some people like it for that reason. Aurelius is not looking at Stoicism in a systematic way, but he can give you a great, you know, sort of introduction to it. I think that along with reading Aurelius's meditations, you also definitely want to read Epictetus's Enchiridion. Now that'll sometimes be called the Golden Sayings or the Handbook. They all mean the same thing. They all refer to this short, uh, very, very short work that is sort of a best hits list put together by Arian, um, who thought that the stuff that he was putting in there you know, kind of gave you a condensation of, of Epictetus's doctrine. It is a bit challenging. Aurelius is also challenging. But I think most readers are up to making some sense out of it, particularly when you go over it multiple times and you think about what, what he's talking about in, in the work and you start comparing these Stoic things to each other. Then we have Seneca. And, you know, Seneca's letters are, you know, a pretty big book, right? These these letters on ethics or letters to Lucilius. And I think you could start by reading a few of them. They're available online. You can find them on, on you know, wiki texts and just pick a few of them to get a flavor of what's going on there. And then eventually you're going to want to read through all of those letters. There is one other text by somebody who's not a Stoic, who is from ancient times, who I think it would be worthwhile for you to read early on, in part because it's rather short. It's called Stoic Paradoxes, and it's by Marcus Tullius Cicero, who was an eclectic philosopher. He identified with the academic school, but he, he drew on the Stoics quite a lot. And so if you put together you know, selections from uh, um, Seneca's 
Letters to Lucilius, or you might pick one of his, you know, shorter works as well. You know, uh, they're, 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 many of them are available in these these other texts. You know, like Hardship and Happiness, for example, contains uh, on the shortness of life or on tranquility of mind, on happy life. Those are good places to start as well. You put together those and. Epictetus's Enchiridion and Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, and now you've got a, a good starting point. After that, you're going to want to continue through. You're definitely going to need to, to read and plan to reread and reread Epictetus's discourses because the Enchiridion is just a sliver of what's in the discourses, and Epictetus is a very important, really central figure. Marcus Aurelius is drawing upon, among others, um, Epictetus. Seneca, you're going to probably want to go on and read uh, all the letters to Lucilius, or the ethic, you know, the letters on ethics, if you like, and probably some of his other works as well. As a matter of fact, if you have the time, why not read all of it if you can? After that, or perhaps in addition to that, there are some other things that you're going to want to read as well. Some are summaries of Stoic doctrine, which will help you out. And one of those is this Arius Didymus, Epitome of Stoic Ethics. Arius himself was not a Stoic. Uh, he also wrote an Epitome of Peripatetic or Aristotelian Ethics as well. But he does give you a nice overview of what it is that the Stoics, in fact, taught in their schools. And, um, you know, we, we've got no reason to think that he's misrepresenting anything. You'll also find similar discussions in Diogenes, Laertes's, uh, Lives of the Philosophers. Book 7 is entirely devoted to the Stoic school, so that's well worth reading. And you're going to find similar discussions in Cicero. Now, I've mentioned Cicero's Stoic paradoxes already, but if you really want to understand Stoicism and you want to study it, you want to read Cicero, and you, there's quite a few texts of his that you want to read. Now, you might say, well, why would I want to read somebody who's not himself a Stoic? Cicero studied under Stoics as well as Epicureans and academic philosophers, and he sort of, you know, picks and chooses. He says, I like this stuff over here. I reject this over here. And because so much of original early Stoic literature has been lost, Cicero is one of the people who gives us a, a good insight into what's, you know, what was it that the Stoics actually did teach? As a matter of fact, he knew Marcus uh, Cato, who is... Um, in one of his dialogues, representing the Stoic position, right? And Cato was, was a, a Stoic philosopher who was also a statesman who Im embodied the philosophy and died as a Stoic during the, the, you know, the Civil Wars, right? So Cicero gives you a lot of important works. I mentioned the Stoic paradoxes already. That's well worth checking out. Um, some of the other texts that are particularly important for understanding the Stoic position. If you want to understand Stoic ethics, then the most important Ciceronian works would be On the Ends, uh, book three of which is devoted to the Stoic system in the mouth of Cato. Book four is Cicero attacking it, of course. Uh, on Duties, which is drawing on Panaetius, the middle Stoic uh, thinker. Um, so he, he, he wrote a book on duty. Cicero thought he could do better, and he's presenting a lot of in, in, interesting Stoic stuff. He's also talking about some of the other Stoic scholarchs and the disagreements that they had with each other on ethical issues. So that's worth checking out. Um, the Tusculan Disputations, very important, longer work, discusses the issue of, of you know, whether we should fear death or not. Um, discusses the emotions in great detail and depth, uh, virtues and vices, uh, all sorts of other interesting topics in there. If what you're looking for is um, Stoic conceptions of religion, then you probably also want to read uh, On the Nature of the Gods, and you should probably check out On Divination. Cicero himself did not accept the Stoic views on divination or on, on you know, determinism. Um, but he presents them to us in a, 
you know, reliable way. So they're worth checking out. And then there's also a short, somewhat fragmentary uh, discussion in On Fate that talks about the Stoics as well. If you're interested in Stoic epistemology, you probably want to read On the Academics. And there's other things in Cicero's work scattered here and there, but I think that's plenty already. Somebody else who I will mention who's worth checking out, and again, you can get it in this book, is Heracles. Um, these are, you know, uh, translations, and actually this book is quite nice because there's an introductory essay and, and notes uh, on the, the text as well. But um, you get to read the, the f somewhat fragmentary works that we have by this guy Heracles, who is another important Stoic figure. Um, there's, there's other, you know, works that you could check out. There's, you know, a, a work of fragments of, of, you know, Stoics, but I, I don't know, unless you really want to become a scholar, that's probably not worth, uh, too much of, of the time that you might spend on it. Um, if you want to go further than that, and I realize I've already said quite a lot, you could read other ancient authors who take a less positive attitude towards the Stoics than Cicero does. Foremost among them would be the Middle Platonist Plutarch. Um, Galen, uh, the medical author, is also well worth checking out, particularly when it comes to the emotions. Um, there's a lot of early Christian authors who also talk about the Stoics in interesting ways. Clement of Alexandria, for example, uh, Justin Martyr, Lactantius talks about them a lot. Um, and, and we learn some things by, by reading these people. I also want to mention um, a few other things as well. And here, you know, it's probably good for me to take a little bit of a side route and tell you a bit about, you know, I've mentioned the early Stoics and the late Stoics and the middle Stoics. So Stoicism starts out with this guy Zeno. And unfortunately, we don't have any full texts by Zeno, but we know texts that he's supposed to have written because they're cataloged in Diogenes Laertes, Lives of the Philosophers. That's one reason why I think you should read that, that work. Um, likewise, the, the other, you know, scholarchs, the people who are in charge of the Stoic school, like his, his, uh, uh fo his follower Cleanthes, and then the third scholar, Chrysippus, very important author, and then Diogenes and Antipater. We don't have works by them. We only have fragments and allusions to them. Those are all the early Stoa, right? And they're, they're there in Athens. Then Stoicism spreads to other places, and we get middle Stoics like Panaetius, who I've mentioned, and also Posidonius. Again, unfortunately, we don't have works by them. So it's, it's hard to tell exactly what they, they thought or taught. Um, we may, in our lifetime, be fortunate and some scroll could be discovered somewhere, but that's unlikely. Uh, one thing does need to be said, though, about the relations of the Stoics to other schools of philosophy. So Stoicism is a Socratic philosophy. It comes in a sort of circuitous path from... Uh, students of Socrates who then had students of their own and, you know, started schools. Um, this guy Zeno studies with Crates the Cynic, but he also studies with members of the Platonic Academy and the Megarian school as well, uh, Stilpo and Polemo. So he's, he's kind of putting things together in, a, in an eclectic way, as far as we can tell, and then forging them into his own new system. You could find reading, um, you know, what we have of the cynics, unfortunately most of their literature is lost, quite useful as well. Um, Epictetus himself has a really long discussion of uh, the cynic in his, his uh, discourses, uh, in a chapter that could be read all by itself in some respects. But somebody else who you might want to check out, who you might get something out of, is another one of Socrates' students, and that's Xenophon. Now, Xenophon also wrote Platonic dialogues, as Plato did. Xenophon's dialogues are, you know, a diff somewhat different character of Socrates, one that's closer 
to what the Stoics were really into. And so you could read, you know, those dialogues by Xenophon, and that, that might be helpful for understanding where somebody like Epictetus is coming from as well. Zeno himself uh, is supposed to have shipwrecked and then, you know, washed up on the shore of Athens, lost all of his money, lost all of his cargo. He's in a books, uh, bookseller's stall, and he's reading Xenophon's uh, account of Socrates, and he says, where can I find somebody like this? And that's when the bookseller points out Crates. So reading about, Zen you know, Socrates through Xenophon could be useful to you. But to go back to, to the start of all this, you know, the big three, that's where you're beginning, some of their shorter works, then read more of their stuff, uh, and keep going back and forth and back and forth. Then, you know, expand to Cicero and maybe some Plutarch, maybe some Galen, maybe some other authors. You've got those summaries of Stoic doctrine that can be quite useful. And this way you can get a really good conception of, you know, what the Stoic school is teaching. And you'll find it quite rewarding. I do have some advice for you that may be helpful based on the authors themselves and their styles and the genres of the text that they're, they're putting in front of you. Um, so, you know, if we start with the big three and we think about Epictetus, Seneca, and Marcus Aurelius, let's, let's start with Aurelius first because that's rather straightforward. We only have one book. Uh, unless you want to read, you know, books about Marcus Aurelius or you want to read some of his uh, letters to Fronto, uh, which are available. But if you're reading his meditations, what you're reading is a book that's actually entitled to, to himself, right? It's a notebook uh, of sorts that he carried around with himself and wrote things as sort of reminders. And so don't look at it as a textbook in which Marcus is speaking directly to a student <laughs> telling you about what Stoicism is. It's more for somebody who already has a good grounding in Stoicism who's writing little reminders to himself or working out some thoughts. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you can't learn a lot about Stoicism from it. Not least because Marcus is, is a pretty, you know, interesting stylist and, and author, and he's a deep thinker as well. Um, and also somebody who's a, a leader of the world at the time, you know, the, the Roman Empire was a significant portion of, of, uh, civilization. Um, what you shouldn't expect in Marcus Aurelius is for all of the passages to line up in some sort of systematic way. He's not doing something like that. So you have to do a bit of correlation. You know, I, I do work, for example, on anger. And he talks about anger at a number of different points in the work, but he never has like a section that is the definitive take on anger. You've got to do some correlation back and forth. You might want to make notes to yourself or, you know, like I do sometimes in my own books. Uh, you can see I've got all the, like, this is Epictetus's uh, discourses, book one. You notice I use two different things, little post-it notes that stick in the side and then a whole bunch of bookmarks, right? You might want to do something like that if you're trying to understand particular uh, areas. Let's talk about Epictetus next. So as I mentioned, the Enchiridion, uh, kind of like a best hits list, if you like, or a digest is another way of putting it. It's taking passages and putting them together uh, as chapters in this, this thing that you could literally hold in your hand, the N in, her hand, idion, little thing, right? And so it's not meant to cover everything having to do with Stoic philosophy. Instead, it's just meant to, again, give you a bunch of very useful reminders. Um, think of it as sort of a starting point rather than the definitive text. If there is a definitive text with, Epic, with, with Epictetus, it is the discourses, and the discourses are quite long and involved. We think that we probably have only half of the discourses that Arian actually wrote, unfortunately, but at least we have half of them, because uh, we could have none, and that would really suck. Um, they are organized more or less according to topics, but again, not everything on a given topic will necessarily be worked out in complete detail in that chapter and that book. 
So you do have to do a bit of correlating. I'll give you one prime example. The Stoics talk about um, what, what we call prolapsis, which means um, sort of uh, general conceptions that we have of things. They sometimes translate as preconceptions. It's discussed at a couple points in book one and at other points throughout the discourses. And you've got to put together sort of a composite picture of that again. Um, when it comes to Seneca, much of what you're reading are actually letters. And interestingly, um, you know, we know who the letters are addressed to, and they, they often speak to us quite well. Um, but Seneca is almost always taking into account the person who he's writing to. So, for example, when you, when you read his letters to Lucilius, you're going to notice him uh, praising, rather uncharacteristically, a rival school of the Stoics, the Epicureans, and even Epicurus himself, but that's because Lucilius is himself somebody interested in Epicureanism. He doesn't do that in other places. Um, letters are not intended to provide a comprehensive, you know, this is the final word on things. Uh, as a matter of fact, Seneca apologizes in some of his letters for allowing them to get too long. Um, and they, they tend to get longer and longer the, the, the further we get into his correspondence. But that's that. That's that. And then Seneca also writes some things that are more philosophical treatises. Another thing that you might find interesting, Seneca also wrote plays. Um, and, and you could consider those to be part of the Stoic corpus as well if you want to read them. So those are worth reading. Cicero is a bit of a tougher read. Um, sometimes he writes things in the form of philosophical treatises. Um, he's assuming an audience that's fairly conversant with the things that he's talking about. He usually does provide some introduction through the mouths of his speakers, but sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he just assumes that you, you understand it. And um, Cicero also writes dialogues. Now, these are not always dialogue dialogues where there's a lot of back and forth, you know, what do you think about this? Well, I think this. Well, I think you're wrong about that point. Quite often there, there'll be long periods in which page after page after page, one person is speaking and they're presenting a point of view. It might be the stoic view on, you know, the gods and the heavens and things like that, and whether you can prove that God exists, for example, in uh, book two of On the Nature of the Gods. Or it might be um, the Epicurean point of view, or it might be something else. It might be criticisms, but quite often it's, it's going to be a long um, discourse. And Cicero will do a lot of explaining along the way, but it, it can be quite helpful to have learned what some of these things mean as well by reading the earlier Stoic thinkers. Um, Heracles, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that we have by him is rather fragmentary, and what we do have is quite interesting. Um, there's, there's not that much to be said about that. Arius Didymus, um, when you read his epitome, if you do read it, you're going to find it's a little bit dry. Uh, it's mostly a bunch of, you know, here's what the Stoics say about this and a whole bunch of classifications, but it's, it's quite useful and it's, it's fairly short, so that can be quite good. Um, another thing to keep in mind, I, I would say, when it comes to reading these Stoics, so the, the, the original early Stoics, they did not give a lot of attention to style, rhetoric, delivery, anything like that. The people that we're getting to, particularly Seneca and Cicero, have a real sense for that. And so they write in a, a way that, you know, the style is structuring and the rhetorical uh, motifs are structuring what it is that they're telling you. Epictetus a little bit less so, but again, it's not straight Epictetus, it's Arian, his... his uh, biographer, well, a historian, military person, uh, and, and Epictetus' recorder, let's call him, right? Because he's not really giving us a biography as such of, of Epictetus. He's more presenting Epictetus speaking to us. But it's still filtered through Arian as well. Uh, Aurelius, of course, has studied all of these, these things, and he's got a good style himself. So you do want to be somewhat attentive to that as well. Um, don't expect, this is the last thing I'm going to say about, about format, 
don't expect any of these books to provide you in a completely systematic form everything that the Stoics are teaching because they had access to the literature that we don't have access to because it's been lost to antiquity. So, you know, you'll find Cicero, Seneca, uh, Epictetus talking about, you know, uh, works by Chrysippus that, that somebody might have, you know, have talked about or prided themselves on being able to interpret. Epictetus actually talks uh, very, very explicitly about that. It says, don't pride yourself on that. Pride yourself on being able to apply it. Um, we don't have that. So in the background of all of this is a systematic philosophy, but it's not being presented to you in a systematic form in the writers that we have. So you do have to do a bit of correlating things and interpreting, and, and this is an iterative process. It's not something that you're going to read all at once and everything will fall into place. It's going to take a lot of going back and forth to, to get a good sense of what it is that the Stoics are actually putting forth as their positions. The very last thing that I'll say is don't expect complete agreement between all the different Stoic figures. We know from, for example, Cicero, that there were disagreements between some of the scholarchs about, about issues. So Epictetus will not always say exactly the same thing that Seneca is saying. They won't always use the same language either. For example, in Seneca, the virtues are really front and center. You don't see Epictetus talking about that so much. Instead, you see him talking a lot more about what's in our control, what's not in our control, the roles that we have, and mitigating uh, conflicts or contradictions. So think of these not as, as contradicting each other, but as highlighting complementary aspects of a common doctrine school and way of life. If you go online and start looking for secondary literature on the Stoics, you're going to be confronted with a vast secondary literature, and you might not really be sure where to start. Um, so I want to say a few things about that. There is one other thing I need to say right at, at the beginning, which is that, you know, since we do have a, a whole movement that we call modern Stoicism, you can look at some of the secondary literature as, in a certain way, a, a, a kind of primary literature as well of contemporary Stoicism. And I would include things like, you know, popular works or more applied works like Massimo Pigliucci's How to Be a Stoic or Donald Robertson's Build Your Resilience, um, Lawrence Becker's uh, New Stoicism, of course, which I'll talk about in a moment, and a lot of other things as well. There, there are people who are practicing Stoics who are contributing to the ongoing development of Stoicism. I'll also put in a, a little plug, too, for Stoicism Today, the, the blog that I edit, this is the uh, set of entries put together by the previous editor, Patrick Usher, um, selected writings, really great stuff by people who are either interested in Stoicism or who are self-identifying as Stoics on all sorts of things from dinner parties to medicine to policing to dealing with grief, you, you name it. So, where might you begin? I also do have to give uh, a few cautions that might be helpful about secondary literature. There's a lot of literature out there that mentions Stoicism or involves Stoicism that's not particularly good. So let me start by talking about academic takes on Stoicism. If you open a work and you find that they're saying that Stoicism is just a retreat from reality, you know, that it came about because of the destruction of the Greek city-states and the loss of, you know, meaning or anything like that, that's a 19th century take on Stoicism that's, that's pretty much dead wrong. Um, it, it doesn't really work well for understanding Stoic authors and usually represents a misinterpretation of them. Um, <clears throat> this is quite common. You know, you see figures like Nietzsche getting the Stoics wrong. 
um, basically because they're not Nietzsche. Hegel getting the Stoics wrong. Bertrand Russell, of course, gets them wrong in his history of philosophy. And we go on and on and on about that. So you do want to be careful about that. And there are some people, even in the present, quite often, unfortunately, Aristotelians who should know better because they've been misinterpreted by so many people who get the Stoics wrong. And so you don't want to waste time so much on, on them. Um, you, you also need to be wary of popular literature on Stoicism that turns it into something that it's not. Stoicism is not a bunch of life hacks. It's not a way to, uh, you know, do the Dale Carnegie thing of making friends and influencing people. That may be a side effect of it, but that's not primarily what it's all about. Um, there's a lot of people who try to, you know, harness Stoicism to produce success in whatever way that they, they view it, but they're really, they, they tend to be pretty superficial in their approach to it, and they're not, they're not really faithful to Stoicism, and the Stoics would look at them and say, you've got some things fundamentally wrong. So that, that's a bit of a problem. Putting all of that stuff aside, let's talk about quality secondary literature. Let's start with this book, right? This is a very influential book uh, by Larry Becker. And if you want to get it, go ahead. I actually spent uh, months leading a client through this, um, in part because it's a very, very difficult work. People who recommend this, I think half of them have not actually managed to read past the introduction. Um, this is a you know, top level difficulty book. I would say this is as difficult as Heidegger or Hegel <clears throat> or, you know, pick whoever else you find particularly difficult. It is a really good book. Uh, and it, and it played an, a very important role in, uh, bringing about the, you know, revival of stoicism, but it's, it's tough. Um, other authors, who are similarly important in the revival of Stoicism that are approaching it more as academics than uh, as uh, popular writers. A. A. Long, really important person. Chris Gill. Um, uh, I have a few other works here uh, by people that fit in there. John Sellers, Brad Inwood. Um, Margaret Graver has a just simply excellent book on stoicism and emotion, but rather challenging. Again, took several months to work through that one as well with, with, uh, some clients. And there's a number of other, you know, recent studies as well that are worth checking out. Brian Johnson's Role Ethics of Epictetus, quite good. Um, this is by Gretchen Radom Schills, the Roman Stoics, you know, and, and we could go on and on and on with all sorts of great secondary lit book recommendations. There's a lot of great scholarship out there. You want to make sure that it's people who are actually sympathetic to the Stoics and not just trying to bash them. And they're not just trying to make a name for themselves by saying that becoming a Stoic will make you, you know, in, in a, uh, sort of uh, Benjamin Franklin, healthy, wealthy, and wise uh, sort, of, sort of thing as well. Um, I did mention, you know, that there is also a popular literature, more applying Stoicism, you know, and I brought up Massimo's How to Be a Stoic as an example, Donald Robertson's uh, Build Your Resilience. There's lots of other things. Robertson and, and, and actually uh, Pigliucci have new books out as well. Um, this is an, another interesting one by somebody who wants to make Stoicism as simple as possible. Chuck uh, Chakrapani, uh, his Unshakable Freedom. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, secondary literature that you can study. I think that there's nothing wrong with reading that stuff. And if you want to begin with it, that's perfectly fine. I, I think that you, if you really want to understand Stoicism, it's always important to go back to the source texts. So uh, again, there should be sort of an iterative process where you're reading Epictetus and then maybe reading a work about Epictetus or, or a piece about Epictetus or an article. And then you go back and read some more Epictetus. First of all, you know, to get back to Epictetus, but also to see if the author got Epictetus right and, and if there's anything that, that that's contributing to help you understand it. So I wouldn't worry too much at the beginning about secondary literature unless you really, really feel that you need that. Um, and then, you know, you can find most of those works online or at local libraries, fortunately. Um, 
or you can order them directly. So that's that's pretty much what I have to say about secondary sources. One of the last things that I, I think I need to talk about a bit is problems and issues that you don't need to be particularly concerned with, but some people really like to push. And the reason I bring this up is because for some, these can become stumbling blocks or obstacles to actually putting in the time to study the Stoic texts and thinkers. They worry too much about these, these issues that will eventually work themselves out in most cases um, by, by doing the study and then they don't do the study. So it's a bit of a chicken egg problem. <clears throat> One of these right off the bat is when you're studying philosophical literature, do not worry about whether you buy into it, whether you accept it all. That's not the measure for whether you're making progress. The, the measure is, are you understanding it? And understanding is not the same thing as agreement, and it's not the same thing even as appreciation. You could find Epictetus dry, but you could find Epictetus incredibly valuable to study. Um, you might not like Seneca's style, um, or you might think he's off on some things, that he, he was too, you know, uh, willing to give in to the Epicureans or something like that, that doesn't have to detract from you actually studying Seneca. So don't worry about whether you buy in or not. Um, another key thing is um, don't worry about the fact that we don't have all of the Stoic sources because you don't need to have all of them in order to get a solid understanding of what it is that the Stoics were teaching. It could be that we'll discover a long lost manuscript by Zeno or Chrysippus or, or, you know, Antipater, and that will really change the way that we view Stoicism. More likely anything that we would find would just reinforce what it is that we already know about Stoicism and contribute a fuller picture. So you don't have to be too preoccupied with the loss of uh, probably clo close to 90% of Stoic literature. Um, you know, it, you also don't need to worry about whether the Stoics have got Socrates right. There's a lot of uh, back and forth in internet forums about that sort of thing. I think that's really a side issue. There were multiple interpretations of, of Socrates. Plato's is one, the Stoics, the Cynics, the, you know, uh, Cyrenaic school, the Euclideans. It, it, they're all uh, different viewpoints on one guy. I don't think it's that important of an issue to worry about. Um, you do also don't have to get drawn into these questions of is X, whether X is a person or a practice, stoic. Um, I think that's quite often a real waste of time and, again, tends to lead people away from actually learning about what Stoicism has to teach. Don't worry about whether this current basketball player or politician or, you know, this, this stance on a particular controversial issue is stoic or not. Figure out what Stoicism is, and then you can tell others whether something is Stoic or not. Um, but people spend a lot of time on that that sort of thing. Um, another thing that I think is is a bit of a, a distraction is trying to say what is the definition of Stoicism or what is the core idea of Stoicism. Seneca tells us super clear. Uh, and this is reinforced by Epictetus, by Cicero, by other people. Stoicism is a complex network of key ideas, distinctions, practices that a person builds and, and sort of incorporates into their personality and into their, their mind. So it's not going to be reducible down to one idea like the dichotomy of control or, or you know, just be virtuous or anything like that. People who tell you that are leading you astray. And they're, you're not doing yourself a favor by buying into them. You don't have to worry about them. You don't have to refute them. But don't get caught in that trap of saying, I have to have the one central idea, because it's a network of ideas that refer to and reinforce each other. Um, so I think those are 
things that, that would be good to keep in mind. I do have a few final thoughts and you might say encouragements for you as a self-directed student. One of these is something that I say to my students in classes, but I say to many other people. If you have enough support and you approach things in the right way, anybody can study philosophy. That doesn't mean that you're going to understand everything right away or even at the very end, but that's not the measure of whether you're doing a good thing by studying a classic philosophical school or thinker or text. You do the best that you can. You use the resources that you have. There's a lot of things available. I've, I've contributed some, but many other people have contributed a lot of great resources to helping people understand Stoicism. And you make progress, and that's the key thing. Do you understand more of Epictetus after putting in a couple of weeks than you did before that? If so, good. You can build upon that. Same thing with Seneca, same thing with Cicero, same thing with Marcus Aurelius, same thing with any of these figures. Um, don't get too drawn into worrying about whether, you know, people or other people have got stoicism completely right. Those debates have been going on forever. Posidonius himself took a lot of heat from his fellow Stoics back in his own time for being unorthodox in important ways. But it's Posidonius that we know anything about and not the, you know, the schmucks who are criticizing him at the time. Stoicism is really a valuable uh, school of philosophy, not, not just for applying stuff, but to understand the world of ideas. It's just as important as Plato or Aristotle, uh, probably more important than the Epicureans, another one of the big schools of the time. So I hope that this encourages you and, and empowers you to dig into the Stoic texts and, um, you know, just make as much progress as you can. You're going to start to see all sorts of cool correlations on issues between the Stoics and other thinkers and within the Stoic school itself. So good luck and I hope you get yourself some Stoic texts, whether it's buying them online or buying them in a bookstore or getting them from a library or, you know, finding them somewhere uh, in somebody else's library and get to it.